Sure. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, hello everyone, uh, welcome back. And uh, this is our sixth session of the seminar series. Uh, we're very excited to have two uh, amazing speakers today, um, experts in the fields of um, desert ecology and also in the uh, field of biomimicry. And so uh, we will be hearing today about the adaptations that uh, evolution has come up with in order to solve the problems of living in a harsh desert environment, number one. And our second sec uh, uh, presentation, we're actually gonna be hearing about how to uh, use some of those solutions that evolution has come up with in order to um, try to live us humans in a more sustainable way. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Ellie Groner. And he is the scientific director of the uh, Dead Sea and Arava Science uh, Center. He is also an ecologist for the Center of Hyperarid Socioecology at the Arava Institute. He specializes on hyperarid ecosystem processes, studying the structure and function of life beyond the limit, especially eco-hydrology. He developed uh, the concept of desert ecosystem integrity that evaluates the value of ecosystems based on their self-organization properties. This is done by studying biodiversity, food webs, and how ecosystems function. Ellie also studies the interactions between human society and desert ecosystems, including ecosystem services and conservation. He is very fond of beetles, I did not know this. And more importantly, apparently he has found a new species of beetle, uh, which has been named after him. So the species that um, has his last name is, and Ellie, make sure that you, um, uh, you know, tell me if I'm mispronouncing this, but it's called Brachycerus groneri. So congratulations on that. I wish I could have a species <laughs> name after me. I don't think it will ever happen. <laughs> so thanks Ellie for being here with us today. Our second speaker is uh, Maya Givon. Uh, Maya has over 13 years of experience in promoting sustainability, including policy and behavior change through civil society organizations. She began her journey as a volunteer and quickly moved to manage national, uh, nation, nationwide uh, campaigns for nature protection and environmental education in Green Course, where she later served as a co-chair of the board. And this just goes to show all of you, especially our young students, that volunteering really can open new doors for you. So never shy away from volunteering. She coordinated a coalition of NGOs under the umbrella organization of environmental movement in Israel. She worked vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, government and parliament to promote climate change policies. She also represented the civil society in the UN conventions and there were two UN conventions in the past nine years, Maya co-founded the Natural Step Israel, which is a non-profit organization, part of the international network dedicated to implementing science-based sustainability. She is joining us from Haifa today in Israel, and Maya obtained her um, bachelor's in the biology from the Technion Institute of Technology, and her master's she uh, got from uh, the international program from Strategic leadership towards sustainability. And this happens to be at a university uh, in uh, Sweden. That's where she discovered this field of uh, biomimicry. And that's when she fell in love with this idea of biomimicry, a very exciting field. Ever since then, she has combined biomimicry as an educational tool with adults and kids and teaching them about biomimicry. Uh, she's also very active uh, with the Israel Biomimicry Organization. So again, Maya, thank you as well. We're delighted that you're also joining us today and teaching us, uh, both of you, about uh, all the adaptations that organisms that not only live but actually thrive in this environment um, have, and then how we can use them to have nature teach us something about the solutions that evolution came up with. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We're very excited. Ellie, do you want to get started? Yes, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you fine. Okay. So, uh, Farid, are you uh, sharing your slide? Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. So uh, I'd like to start, I know that uh, Becky spoke with you before. Uh, I'd like to start with what do you associate desert ecosystems with? So please uh, go to uh, the Mentimeter and write a uh, one word or um, anything that comes up to mind and let's see where we go with that. It's in the chat now. Very interesting. You're muted. Ellie, you're muted. Very interesting. So cacti is a um, new world uh, plant. Many Israelis think that it's a uh, subrace is Israeli, but actually it's American. Sand is actually a rarity in the desert usually. So um, very interesting. Okay, um, do you want to continue? Or shall we go on? Let's go on. So I'm going to share my own screen now and hope for the best. Okay. Okay, can you, can you see my screen? Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about deserts, and the first question is again, what do we associate with them? And uh, we've so we've seen what you associated with them, and um, the question is, what exactly is a desert? So is this a desert? We can see pretty bare, and maybe this is a desert. All the pictures are taken from the Negev, or maybe this is a desert. And uh, all of them are deserts. They're semi-arid and arid and hyper-arid. And uh, what, the question that comes from uh, what you've seen, what you've shown is why are deserts so empty? So the word bare and empty came about quite a lot. And so the question is why, why are they so empty? And everybody says, because there's no water. But did you ever stop to think why water is so important? Why not sugar or carbon or nitrogen? Why is it water that is a driving a, a parameter that is so important that when there's lack of water, we have such an empty uh, ecosystem? And the reason, it's not so trivial, and the reason is to think what is the source of life? What, what is the source of life? If you ever look at the evolution of life, uh, for about one billion years, there was nothing on this planet. And then for about more than three billion, 3 billion years, we only had very simple life like bacteria and single cells, all of it in the water. And only recently in the last billion years, we have multi cells, sophisticated creatures like animals, plants and fungi, and then they left the water. So being out of the water is pretty recent. And that's why having area without water is the most, uh, the largest challenge that we have. And so maybe we haven't finished adopting to live outside the water, which is why uh, most of the desert is bare. 
So this is the summary of what we see. The less water is, the more conditions are considered harsh. Maybe if life evolved in the desert, water would have been a poison. These are, this is a map of aridity around the world. Uh, the, the lower the, the parameter, the more dry it is. And you can see Sahara and the Arabian is the uh, driest, uh, even though the driest uh, desert is actually in Chile, the Atacama. And now we have to talk about what are the difficulties and challenges that creatures have when they live in the desert. So, Francis, can you share my presentation and I'll continue from there? Yes, let me just pull it up. You're frozen oh. for me right now, but I... Okay, I, my computer is off, so if you... Yeah, let me pull it up. Hey, we have Go a back speaker. To sharing. Our computer I'll... keeps freezing. Share with us. Um, meanwhile, explain. So a very big challenge, peers, in um, the dryness, we talked about it because there's no water, but also we're talking about hot desert. Antarctica is a cold desert, but we're talking now about hot desert and the, the challenge in many cases is heat. We'll talk about the difference between animals and plants regarding dryness and, uh, and heat, but also the unpredictability of pre uh, perception because you never know uh, how much rain will come. Most of the uh, precipitation in the deserts are, uh, is coming from water, at least in most places. Okay, thank you, Francis. Just, just, uh, yeah, that's fine, and when I'll tell you. Just, just choose one of them and I'll guide you. Yeah, go ahead, please. One more. One more. One more. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one more. No, go forward. I don't know what's going on. It's oscillate, sorry, it's oscillating between seven. And okay, I'll, I'll talk meanwhile and about the difficulty. So the fact, there we go, excellent. So the unpredictability of, precipit of precipitation is a very big challenge because where I live in Mitzperamon in the Negev, last year was the rainiest year since we started measuring or anybody. And this year we had zero floods, very, very little rain. So for a, a plant or an animal, it's very difficult to cope with that. And for animals, also low productivity. Next slide, please. Oh. Yes. Okay. Keep it. Uh, next slide. OK, so how, how do we deal with those um, uh, challenges? We, uh, plants and animals can deal with them with their physiology, which is in the internal uh, function of their organism, of organs with their morphology, how they look, and probably um, Maya will talk mostly about morphology, with their behavior, especially animals, and phenology, which is the seasonality or the timing. Next slide, please. There are structure adaptation, which we can see, and there's behavioral adaptation. Plants behave, but we are mostly talking about animals. Next slide. We can divide both plants and animals to three categories. Those who avoid it, evaders, who try to escape from the, diff the harsh conditions, either in space or time. So for example, uh, annual plants that only germinate when there's water, the adult plant, the, the, not the seed, don't even know the, how difficult it is to be in the summer, or if they are active in the night, these are evaders. The evaporators are animals that use water to cool themselves down, and the jurors are the tough animals and plants that can tolerate the harsh conditions. Next slide. So we'll start with animals. You can see examples of few animals. Next, please. Okay, this is uh, the irony or the paradox of using water to cool. Uh, animals basically die from overheating, not from lack of water. 
but overheating can really affect our body. We all know what happens to a, a child who's uh, got fever. And so we use water, for example, sweating, to cool the body down. And then because the body is not perfect, we lose so much water that we get uh, dehydrated and we can die for that. That is the paradox because the body is deliberately using water to cool itself down. That doesn't happen with plants. Next slide. Okay, so animals can die from overheating, but the uh, breathing or panting or sweating can cool ourselves. Next. The bigger the animal, the more difficult it is to lose heat. This is called the Bergman rule, which if you think about animals, the same species in cold climate has bigger body, and I'll, show, I'll soon show you a picture. And in hot climate, the, the smaller you are, the smaller the body size is, the easier it is to live, uh, to, to lose uh, heat. Next. Next. Okay, let's start with the vein. Next. Okay, so there are many places in the desert that animals are able to find shelter during the day, burrows that they burrow themselves under shrubs or even inside rocks in places. So they hide there during the hot hours. This is a, a, a finding a location. And then at night or when it's colder climate, they can uh, uh, come out. Next. Okay, so you are probably familiar with the word hibernation. There is a similar word in the, in the, in the desert called estivation, which means being asleep during the summer. And many animals are dormant either uh, as a larva or as seeds for plants, and they are only active in the winter or in the spring. Next. Now we come to evaporators. Next. So usually middle size of body are the ones who are using water to cool themselves. We know that dogs are panting, but also rabbits and foxes and humans and even some birds are able to lose, uh, to cool themselves by taking the heat from their body and putting it in water and then the, the water evaporates and the body uh, uh, cools itself. Next. We now come to the real uh, creatures that are can, can take that. So these are uh, go back to the wolves. Uh, the the wolves are a, a, the same species. So it's for Israelis. It's very funny to listen to Red uh, Riding Hood and Peter and the Wolf and all those stories because the wolves in Israel are so small. We don't understand how the tradition of those stories got about uh, because the same species of wolves in Europe is actually very large animals that can frighten children and their parents. But in Israel, the wolves are much smaller because in the desert, a small body size allows you to lose heat. Next. We can see here uh, uh, the Ellen rule uh, is, 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 is talking about losing heat through uh, the length of, uh, of some organs, for example, ears. Okay, so you can see here the caracal and the fennec uh, fox that they, it looks like in the story of the red, Little Red Riding Hood that they want to hear better but actually it's a means of uh, losing a uh, heat. Next. Uh, now about water, water collection. So uh, water is, uh, is, is scarce in the desert and there are many interesting ways of collecting water. What you see here is uh, beetles from the family of darkling beetles that live in Namibia. In Namibia, we have a lot of dew and they have evolved to stand on their head and collect along their body dew with the high exposure of, of their body. You can see on the top right also um, the fact that the body is not smooth to allow uh, to collect even more dew. And then they have special uh, fishes that take water all the way up to their mouth and they drink it. So they actually get most of the water from dew collected on their body. Next. Another way to, an, a way to cool yourself is many of the uh, desert animals have long legs. We can see here the oryx and the camel, which maybe are more famous, but even the lizard and the ant and the beetles have long legs and it's enough. One centimeter is enough to really, really uh, cool yourself when you are getting away from the soil. Thank you. Next. Uh, these darkling beetles who are uh, adapted really well to the desert, uh, 
have a, 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 a cavity under their, uh, this, under their cuticle that also isolates them like we, we do in houses in order to um, not heat up so much. Next. We lose a lot of water in our urine. And so urea is a very a water expensive ways of losing uh, poison and, and nitrogen. So many desert creatures use uric acid, which is like a toothpaste or something like that. So it's got much less water. Next. And you won't believe it, but in the um, process of oxidation, which is eating, which is the opposite of photosynthesis, we, uh, water is actually a byproduct. So small creatures can use this physiological water and they can drink, eat entirely dry materials and just from this physiological water, get enough uh, moisture. Next. We move to plants. You can see many different plants. Next. And just a few examples. So of course, roots are, are very important to get water and there are very many <clears throat> variety of roots. Some of them going very deep and some of them going to the sides and the plants really behave and know where to, where to send the water. Next. You can see here uh, different plants, different variety and with a very high plasticity. So if you have, if you put water on the right hand side of a plant, all the roots will go to the right hand side and they are really adopted to that. Next. In desert, we, we know the cacti, cactus and, and many of them uh, um, they uh, use the stem as photosynthesis and then the surface area of the leaves is much smaller, allowing um, a, a less exposure to the heat. Next. Seeds are very important because many, many plants uh, tolerate the heat of the summer by uh, staying as seeds, dry seeds, and they can survive the summer. And then the, the adult plant only survives in the winter. Next. Ellie, can you um, wrap up in about two minutes? Yes, yes. Uh, so we talked about phenology. Um, next. Um, again, many plants lose water through their uh, opening. So many of them hide them beneath the leaves. Next. Next. Okay, I'll skip that one. Next. Next. Okay, so summary. So to summarize, we saw a very different um, um, adaptations, both in how animals and plants behave, the physiological and physiological water, and uh, um, how they look. Uh, I, I assume that Maya will talk mostly about how they look, but that's not the only way. There are many other mechanisms of dealing with the desert. And we saw in the first slide, the deserts are still bare, but it's got amazing diversity of adaptation. I'm sorry about the technical problems and we'll, that's mine. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ali. Thank you, Ali, appreciate it. And we will have time to, um, to ask questions uh, later on. Once uh, Maya's presentation is over, then we'll have probably I don't know, give two, 20 minutes probably to, to have questions and answers. So um, if you have any questions and you wanna start sending them on uh, via the chat, by all means, um, we will save those and then Francis will, will be you know, asking them for our panel. Thank you. Maya, we would love to hear you now. All right, so just bring my screen, can you see it? Yep. Okay. So thank you so much for inviting me this evening. Thank you, Francis and Farid and everyone hosting. And, and Melissa and Melissa, I'm so excited. I've never had someone translating me into sign language before. So this is really exciting for me. And um, I really enjoy every opportunity I have to share this passion. Um, I spent most of the last decade working on sustainability, mostly on the policy arena, but also on behavioral change. and Frankly, biomimicry is one of the most powerful tools I have found, um, not necessarily for technological innovations, which is what we're going to talk mostly about tonight, uh, but mostly for paradigm shift. 
uh, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I really have a short time tonight. It's going to be really an introduction for this field. Um, we're going to talk about what does it mean, what is behind it, the motivation, a little bit about the history, just a tiny bit. Um, I'll also give you three design lessons from Mother Nature. Uh, one of them will be focused totally on the desert and definitely a lot of examples and stories. So let's just jump straight into it. So I'll have, please, Francis, if you can share the link now. We're going to start with a riddle. Now, I know you, I haven't said a word about what biomimicry is, and I'm already asking you about it. So please just go with your gut instinct. Don't worry if you have no idea. Don't worry if you're just guessing. Um, what I'm asking you is actually which of the following inventions is not biomimetic. So it's not inspired by nature. All right, and I'm going to switch my screen now so you can actually um, see the results. Let's see. All right, the results are flowing in. I'm going to see them changing now. While you're at it, I'm going to read them out loud just in case someone needs it. So we have the Eiffel Tower, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, the telephone the sonar or radar, very similar technologies, and the Velcro. So the Velcro is this uh, reattachable piece of clothing that you can use in, in shoes and in garments. Um, all right, so most of you so far think that the telephone is not a biomimetic invention. All right, you can still keep going, that's okay. I'm gonna switch back to my presentation just so we are on time. And we're gonna come back to it um, at the end of the presentation. So I'm, I'm keeping you a little bit uh, on your toes now, but you can keep guessing, that's fine. So the whole idea, the core idea behind biometry is that we are actually surrounded by million of brilliant inventions. All of the living creatures today, doesn't matter if they're tiny, uh, micro or, or giant, uh, it doesn't matter if we call them complex or simple, they are all brilliant inventions because they manage to find ways to face all the challenges that we also face um, in many different ways, in many different adaptations, as Ellie just shared with us. Um, and they have all survived the longest R&D process, the evolution of 3.8 million of years, some of them are, of course, newer, such as ourselves, um, providing for themselves, providing for their youngsters, and found very interesting ways of doing that. And biomimicry inspires us to look at nature and learn from it, not only about it, not use it, but see it as a mentor. This is the whole notion behind it. And the whole idea is that we're actually not the first ones to deal with such challenges. So, for example, we're not the only ones who need to build shelters. I wonder if anyone can recognize what this is. So this is a shelter. This is actually a nest by a cute bird that is called the bower bird. Um, I hope you can see the gif so you can actually see the male uh, while he's working on his masterpiece. But what's really unique that it's not only building this shelter, which is mainly using for uh, attracting females, not so much as a shelter as you can see, but if you can see all the blue parts surrounding the nest, so these are plastic caps and straws that he's been collecting and organizing, so this guy is not only building, he's also doing the landscape design, um, and this is not an accident, in fact all the males of these species are doing this. Um, here's another example, different, different style maybe. Uh, this guy is going for a different color palette, trying something else, mixing uh, some plastics with some natural things, thank God, not only plastics in the forest. Um, and one of the assumptions is that um, you can see here the nest is constructed totally differently. One of the assumptions is that the way they're doing it is actually emphasizing the size of the nest. So making it bigger and making it more attractive to females. So 
Okay, so an example for aesthetics that is happening in nature, and we might not even concerned or consider that as something that actually happens there. Another challenge, very basic, as Ellie just showed us, is absolutely finding, storing, harvesting, um, sometimes filtering water, which is basic for life. So the Nami uh, desert um, beetle is doing this, just drinking, literally drinking from air. She's drinking, uh, it's drinking fog. Um, and the way it can do it, it's uh, the, the solution or the riddle is in its microstructure. So if we look closely at the outer shell, the outer layer, we could see through a microscope that it has little bumps and little holes in it uh, that connects to tunnels. And they, some of those are hydrophobic, so they repel water, and others are drawing water, so they're hydrophilic. And the construction between those um, actually creates the condensation of fog from air. And through the tunnels, all she has to do is just lift her uh, behind part and push the water um, based on, on just uh, physical forces straight to her mouth and drink without any energy investing. Um, and there are a few inventions based on these specific uh, principles, which are really, really simple, but um, creating elegant ways to provide water in rural places. So these are just two examples for challenges that we share with many other creatures, uh, but there are many other challenges that all of us have. Of course, not every bacteria is uh, worried about um, packing or cleaning up, but many of the more complex organisms are. And so we could learn something from them because we are the only species that is solving our problems while um, risking our own future. So the way we've learned to meet our needs is actually creating systematic problems um, that are risking our own future and definitely everybody else's on this planet. And many other um, species have learned to meet their ne needs without creating such problems. There, in fact, there is no such thing as waste in nature. Um, the system is balancing itself, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> um, that one's cre creature waste is becoming another creature's food. So it's all circular and we couldn't, do not see waste in nature. Also, we are heavily dependent on finite resources for energy that also poses some uh, challenging. And we talk a lot about climate change. I'm sure uh, you've addressed that in the series. I'm not going to go into it. <coughs> Excuse me, but definitely all the challenges that we face, climate change being just the perfect storm. There are many other sustainability challenges that really begs us to look around us and see if there's something else that we can learn from nature because um, we really have to make this leap in evolution. Uh, we are one of the youngest species on earth and we have to learn how we can fit here elegantly, how we can meet our needs without creating waste, without uh, jeopardizing the next generations and every other species on earth. So this is the idea behind biomimicry. And the term itself is fairly new, although the idea is quite old. Uh, so biomimicry is the name for the uh, really soaring discipline of learning from nature mimicking or emulating life solutions in different fields of technology. Um, so bio, of course, coming from life, like biology and biotechnology, and mimesis is from Greek for imitating and learning. Uh, this is the lady who coined the term back in 1997. Her name is Dr. Janine Benius. Um, she's a writer and a zoologist. <clears throat> and uh, thanks to her, uh, this is now really uh, known and used all over the place. Uh, but it's, as I said, it's not a new idea, but uh, her book and her discipline and along with the organization she founded in the US called Biomimicry 3.8, um, which is really leading in the whole world. Uh, now you can see the, the locations where are many different others organizations that promote the field, including in Israel. 
uh, with her um, coining the terms and plus a couple of uh, advancement in technology that really allow us to learn about the microorganisms, about microstructures, and really understand what are the solutions that allow nature to be so brilliant. Uh, that is what brought a really, um, uh, really great development in the field in the past 20 years. So as I said, there are applications of, of biomimicry in almost every possible field of knowledge you can think of, being architecture and materials, robotics, um, engineering, design, but also management um, and leadership and behaviors in teams, um, which are really, really inspiring as well. So if you're keen, if you get the, the taste for it, I can leave you with a few recommendations where to start um, and look into these things. It's also nice to know that you can now get a degree in biomimicry. Um, and there are a couple of, of um, research institutes, including in the Harvard University and the MIT have departments for biomimicry. So this is really uh, one of the um, uh, driving forces of innovation today. So I'd like to give you an example just to really solidify what the hell that means. So if we look at the lotus, the lotus flower, which is being a symbol for, for um, cleanliness and, and purification in many cultures, um, it usually grows in muddy water, and yet it keeps completely clean. And the reason that it has to keep clean is that it has to eat. What do I mean by that? If it will get muddy, right? What, what we see now is a, is a close up on the lotus leaf and you can see how it pushes away the water. Uh, someone is trying to get it wet, but it's actually impossible. So what happens is the microstructure of the leaf is pushing away water, as I said, hydrophobic, again, there's that word. Um, and while doing that, the water would just uh, take the dirt with them. What we see now is, uh, is through a microscope, and you can see this is a droplet of water uh, being rolled. You can see it cannot sit on the surface of the leaf. So it, it rolls away and it takes away the dirt. And you get um, detergent-free, um, passive, totally energy passive cleaning um, mechanism free of charge. And this is how the, uh, the lotus is actually keeping clean. So now we call this thing out the lotus effect. It's, it's well studied. And there's a number of applications based on the same idea. So we don't use the leaf itself. We mimic it. We use it in a variety of different materials to use it for our own needs. And one application, for example, is a paint um, for outside surfaces such as walls that can clean themselves now with every rain that takes the dirt away. Or another application is um, coating for windows of airplanes to prevent freeze because it would not allow the water vapor to stay on the shield. Um, so this is really one of the most uh, famous example for biomimicry and it's used all over. Um, at this point, I would uh, give you a few examples for uh, design lessons from uh, modern nature. So the first one is that we're actually learning from nature. As I said, we're not using it. This is biotechnology. We're not re-engineering the butterfly or using the leaves, but we're learning, mimicking, and emulating. And the emulating is not necessarily copying. Sometimes we need to do our own adaptations to make it work. So what do I mean by that? I guess the most famous example is our flying. I mean, we've always looked at birds and we wanted to do the same. And we can see throughout history, mankind trying to grow wings or create wings. And even the flying machine by Leonardo da Vinci in the 14th century uh, was designed based on dragonfly and birds. And this is partly why Leonardo da Vinci is considered to be the father of biomimicry. Um, also, in the 20 and 19 centuries, we've been trying to flap our wings to, to get off the ground, but it took the Bright brothers to understand that what we need to mimic is actually the proportion of the wing of the bird. So we need to keep that, get rid of the flapping, that's not going to work, we need an engine to create enough um, lift power 
And there you go, this works. This works. Um, another uh, recent application for biomimicry that you might have seen yourself, that most of the wings now of the airplanes got this little twist, little, little curve at the end. And there you go, here's the model. And the reason this is used is because the scientists discovered this is reducing drag or resistant um, significantly. So every time an airplane takes off, the tips of the wings create turbulences and then the next airplane has to wait before they can take off too. Often they would wait with the engines on, uh, wasting a lot of, of fuel and time and money. So this little addition, which is completely biomimetic, is saving money and time and fuel because it shortens the time that each airplane needs to wait before the next one is taking off. So um, such a small thing and such great improvement thanks to uh, soaring birds. The next uh, lesson I'd like to share is that when we do the biometric um, process, and there is, there is a methodology for it. I mean, many of the famous inventions um, have this storytelling that it's usually by accident. Someone saw this bird and immediately thought of the engine of the, and, but actually uh, there is a very organized methodology. Now, actually there's more than one where you can do systemic innovation based on nature. And one of the principles is really to focus on the function. So this can open up a huge set of possibilities and the solution can come from an unexpected source. So to explain why I mean by that, I would like to share another riddle. So what you see here is a wind turbine. And yes, it only has two wings. It's not an accident. This is how it's been designed. And this is a biomimetic design, meaning it was inspired by an animal this time. Although you could do biomimicry on fungi and bacteria and every level of uh, complexity in nature. Um, so this one is based on an animal. And my question to you, and um, we're going to have another Mentimeter quick question for you now, is who was the animal? Which of the following uh, animals was the inspiration source? Was it the electric eel? Was it a heron or maybe a whale? You can um, start voting now <laughs> and I'll share the screen so you can see. Okay. Don't worry if it takes a few seconds uh, to see all the options. It's totally normal. It sometimes takes some time. And you can see um, the link at the chat box. Thanks, Francis, for taking care of this. Hmm. I wonder if you can vote or is there any problem? Because so far I cannot see. I tried answer. voting Maya and it's, my answer is not showing up. It's not showing. That's interesting. But it says, thank you for your participation. That's weird. All right. Hmm. I wonder what happened. Let's go back to the presentation. I'm sorry for this. We're going to check that later. Um, I'm going to back to the presentation. And well, here's the right answer. If you chose the whale, you are correct. So the turbines we've seen are developed by Whale Power Corporation and the founder um, noticed something interesting about the fins of whales. You can see the bumps here. Many species of whales have these. Some of them also have them on the tail. And the design principle, the very basic design principle of nature says, if something is there or if something is designed in a certain way, there is a reason for that. Mother Nature would not spend resources or energy on something that doesn't work. But if it's there, it has a function. And so the function of these bumps is actually, again, to reduce drag or to help um, the whale swim more efficiently without energy um, in the water. 
Um, and the idea, or maybe the brilliant part of this invention was to understand that this function can work also in another medium, in the air, reducing drug, and then for creating a turbine that can create electricity when the wind is actually in much lower speed. And uh, voila, creating the Whale Power Corporation. This is a working company. You can look it up online. The next lesson takes us to the desert, although all of them, all the, the, the principles I've mentioned before exist there too, of course, but this one speaks it out the most. So when we're looking at for models in nature, we're often looking for the champions. What does that mean? Well, if we talk about the challenge of finding water, many animals and, and species have them, but some have more difficulties in meeting that challenge. So obviously in extreme surroundings like the desert, some animals or creatures, doesn't have to be animals, um, some organisms have to really excel to be able to survive and flourishing them. And then we're gonna go and look for these animals because if they have survived there, they clearly have some secrets they can share with us. Um, so Ellie taught, talked about water and different adaptations, the extreme weather, the heat, uh, although there could be some, some cold desert, of course, erosion and so forth. Um, I would like to start with thermoregulation. This is definitely, um, probably desert is the place to find ideas to how we can construct, design and build our build, uh, buildings in a more efficient ways. And definitely this is going to be a challenge we're going to have to look better into in the coming decades as uh, climate change is advancing. So what you see here um, is a succulent, is a, a cacti, um, and you can see the uh, thermography. So obviously um, the red, orange are the hot scale when you get to the cooler colors like purple and blue, these are colder surfaces. And look at how this plant is managing to keep itself cool in such harsh and hot environment. And the secret, again, it's this time it's morphology, but also chemistry, of course. Um, so many of the secrets or the solutions is in the way those animals are structured, but also in the way they are built, their chemistry, their physics, what they do, um, their proteins are shaped differently. Um, we're going to talk more about this soon. So one of the um, techniques here is really to shade himself, itself. Uh, those foldings of the cacti create shadings or partial shadings. When the sun is not exactly directed, but a little bit angular, it creates some shading. But also um, it has a very thick outer layer, cuticle, that really prevents uh, from water to vapor and also creates a very strong insulation. So very simple techniques that we can definitely improve at in our own buildings. Here's another example, um, the desert snails. There are different species that do practically the same thing. Um, they keep a certain temperature inside, uh, which is sometimes 20 degrees lower than the temperature outside and the surface temperature. So uh, for those of you who read Fahrenheit, so 65, let me get that, 65 uh, degrees Fahrenheit is I think over 140, um, 65 Celsius is 140 to Fahrenheit, and they're keeping inside at 120 Fahrenheit, more or less. And the way they do it is basically two, two things, two techniques. One, is a reflection of light. So the outer coating is reflecting out most of the light radiation. Um, and the other one is really, again, isolation or insulation. So they retreat to the inside parts of their shells away from the ground, and then they seal themselves with a bubble of air um, that really prevents from the heat to come in. And what you see below, these are design concepts that actually won a design challenge uh, awards back in, I think, 2012 by a group of students uh, from the art university in Isfahan of Iran. Um, they've suggested such buildings, such constructions can be really efficient for desert uh, dwelling. 
and they ran some tests and simulations and they really achieved some good results in preventing um, from heat to uh, penetrate the inside of those surfaces. Um, what you see here is, um, is a visitor center in Nevada um, that was actually designed or at the, the, the design process, um, the Biomimicry 3.8 organization participated as consultants and uh, they mapped 24 organisms that contributed ideas and technologies for how to create this building uh, in the most efficient passive energy possible. And one example is uh, this cute uh, black tail jackrabbit uh, that, as you can see, um, has a long legs, but also has very long ears and um, uses them also to cool himself. So he can regulate uh, the blood vessels in the ears to pull away some heat from the core of the body and uh, ventilize them in, in the outer surface. And they based some really interesting um, uh, thermoregulation systems that run in tubes all throughout the walls and the base of those um, of the structure to create really uh, passive energy, uh, really highly efficient structure that almost uses no electricity for thermoregulation in the desert. Another organism that does thermoregulation very efficiently um, are the termites. So what you see here is not the nest, obviously, this is just the chimney of the huge nest that could be, actually it's not, it's not a home, it's a city uh, underground. And they have to keep a very stable um, temperature underground, not because they're, they don't fancy or don't like any other temperature, but because they are farmers. And this is something most people don't know. Uh, we do know all that termites eat wood, but actually they don't eat the wood. They feed the wood to a fungi that they grow underground. And this fungi is extremely um, uh, sensitive to temperatures. So just for it, they need to keep it really, really stable. Uh, so the way they do it is with those chimneys that really, sorry, function as uh, ventilation uh, tunnels. So they draw out the hot air outside keep it fresh and keep it cool underneath so they can uh, grow their fungi um, without any um, harm uh, based on the out outside conditions. And sometimes the uh, temperature differences can be extreme. So it could be 50 degrees in the, in the, in the morning and minus degrees at night, um, but the fungi receives its conditions thanks to this amazing ventilation system. Um, and we use it too. Um, I know some traditional construction ways in the Middle East have used uh, mashrabiya and some ideas like that that really build on those natural cooling tunnels. Um, this is an example in Africa that was really modeled after a termites nest. Um, it's called the East Gate. It's a shopping mall in Harare, which is the uh, capital of Zimbabwe also available online, you can look it up, and also very, very efficient in using electricity for term regulation. Uh, moving on to something else, which is resilience for erosion. So I know Ellie mentioned there is not much of sand in the desert, but those who does have um, sand dunes and sand winds could be really erosive. Um, wind can and wind and sand can really uh, strap away paint uh, from metals but all the animals that live there are extremely resilient and again the solution of how they do it is in the micro uh, micro level of things so what you see here on the left is a type of um, an imprint of the shell of the scorpion but what i want to focus on is the right image so one way, if we use a um, uh, totally um, plain surface, which usually na nature never does, only we use those kind of uh, surfaces, then the wind would take the, wind, the sand grain and would just crash it directly to the surface. The other possibility, which is used in nature, is to have those small tunnels and bumps 
And this creates small turbulences and in turn, they push away the grains from the surface and then preventing the crushes and preventing the erosion. Again, it sounds very simple, very basic and simple. Um, and yet these are things that we often don't use in our techniques and uh, technologies. Um, I think we're approaching the end now. I, I also wanted to talk about mobility in the desert. It's not necessarily an easy thing to achieve, especially if you're a plant. Um, and this is a challenge actually every plant has. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's in a desert or in a more accommodating conditions. They would like to spread their seeds as far as possible. But these plants in desert conditions found an amazing solution. It just, um, when the time is right, when it's completely dry and the seeds are ready, um, it has a mechanism that detaches itself from the main stem, as you can see here. And the shape, it's really uh, round as a ball, really allows him to tumble. So this is the famous tumbleweed uh, that Westerns, those of us who's, who've seen Westerns, um, are, are very famous. There's always this tumbleweed in, in the silence, in the desert rolling away. Uh, it, they actually do exist. They actually pose significant uh, trouble sometimes for, for ecologists and farmers, um, mostly in the US. Uh, this is not endemic species to the US, but it feels very good there. So it's an evasive species. Um, and look at this solution of achieving movement based on uh, on the wind, basically. So zero energy, totally dependent on the wind, but it takes it very far away without it needing to invest any energy of itself. Now, this idea was explored by NASA, amazingly, um, as a design concept for their new probe for Mars, right? Um, this one is still not applied, not even as a concept, but I, I was really excited about it and I thought I would share and maybe one of you would have the idea of how this could be applied and maybe, who knows, will be the next biomimetic uh, designer. So this is the Oriental Hornet. Um, it, one of the, it's one of the only hornet species that actually survives and thrives in deserts. Um, it also can be found in other biomes. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's a social species and it works during the day, but unlike other species of hornets, this one is extremely active throughout midday. So when the sun is hottest, um, this one doesn't hide like its sisters, but it's really active um, being outside and looking for prey and also digging tunnels on the ground. And uh, some discoveries have discovered that it has a very interesting pigment that can actually absorb or harvest the sunlight. Um, how exactly it does that and what it does it for, it's still being studied, it's not certain yet, but there are several assumptions that it actually uses this electric, uh, electric uh, energy for movement. So actually using sunlight, um, sort of a photosynthesis for animals, um, harvesting the sunshine, turning it into an electric energy that uh, turns into mobility and using it to move and so on. Also, they've discovered that some of the liver functions are actually happening in the hornet's um, outer cuticle. So the outer shell is also performing some of the duties that normally a liver does. And those functions are connected to the UV light that is absorbed through those pigments. So there is also a possibility that its chemistry is actually creating sunlight, using it, harvesting it, and creating proteins using that energy. Um, again, this is still under study and really interesting, exciting news to see how this might turn out. Um, this is just to give you an example of how the chemistry of those amazing creatures that deal with extreme conditions sometimes can, can create things that we are not even considering as possible. Um, and I can't wait to see what is possible with that. So 
Uh, we're approaching the end of our presentation, and I just remind you this uh, riddle we had in the beginning. So which is not biomimetic, meaning which was not based on some na natural model? Drums, please. This is our answer. So the Eiffel Tower, okay, designed by Gustav Eiffel, um, is actually inspired by bone structure. Uh, the idea was to create the most uh, strong structure, but using less mass or less waste, um, weight, sorry. And uh, the bone structure actually of humans was uh, the inspiration. And if you look closer, um, those, those, the inner structure really have some uh, similarity to the way our bones are connected. Uh, the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, admitted that he used the structure or the human ear um, as its source of inspiration, um, transmitting um, wave sounds, sounds of waves, sorry, into electrical waves uh, using a membrane. Uh, this is exactly what our ear does and what the phone, the all type of phones used to do. And finally, the Velcro, um, was uh, designed based on a seed, a thorny seed that uh, was attaching to dog's fur. Uh, so the story goes that this uh, scientist um, in Switzerland walked his dog and then spent hours taking off the seeds away from the dog's fur. And then he realized this is actually interesting. So it, this is actually an attachment mechanism without using any glue or any chemical uh, that can be used forever, many times, attached and reattached and separate and so, so on. Um, and he thought, hey, this, this could actually work for us as well. So um, the Velcro is actually imitating on one side the dog's fur and the other side the torns that have tiny loops um, at the ends. And the sonar or the radar is actually also something that happens in nature. It does exist in nature in dolphins and in bats. They use very similar technology, but the human technology was not based on them. It was um, um, discovered or, or developed um, separately from nature. So now you know, you can share with friends. Um, I bet this is a very cool um, conversation starter. Hey, do you know what is not just kidding. Um, but this is really just to give you an idea of how many things that we use today and kind of take for granted are actually um, coming from nature. I would just leave you with this. So the, maybe the final um, design lesson from Mother Nature is that really reality exceeds our imagination. Um, there are incredible creatures and processes that are not um, are not possible for us as with our human engineering and wisdom and experience and culture, we cannot do what many of those creatures do. There is a, a wood frog that can freeze itself literally to death and remain without any pulse and without metabolism for six weeks when, it's, uh, when temperature goes below zero and then it comes back to life. We have no idea how to do that. Um, there are creatures that can um, recreate themselves from their head only. So tiny worm that can lose the body and grow the rest of the body from the head again. Um, really, these are some scenarios taken from some sci-fi movies, but they actually exist. Um, and I hope it also begs us to look at nature differently because with every species that we lose, we lose a sea of knowledge of secrets. Um, and if anything, this might inspire us to be a little bit more careful with what we do. I think the biggest lesson we will learn is to look differently at nature, uh, to look, as I said, to look at it as a mentor, um, also as a model, maybe even a measure of what we want to our things, stuff, forms, buildings to function as, um, to be efficient, to be elegantly fitting with one another um, and mostly to be conducive to life, uh, which is what nature does. 
Uh, so for those of you who are interested to read more, here are some good um, links to start with. I can also, we can also send them to you if you're interested. And thank you so much for your listening. I hope you got, um, got the taste for looking more into this amazing field. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Dr. Maya Mizrad Givon. Thank you so much, Dr. Elegrin. Not a doctor yet, but thank you. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry. I got, okay, hopefully, inshallah. So I would love to thank both of you for a fascinating, intriguing, thought-provoking lecture. And I think what we could learn from those two lectures that there are always a lot of things lying beneath and we need to open our eyes. Dr. Eli, you have shown us that the desert is not desolate, is not barren, it's not a wasteland. It's blooming with life, but it's not the same life that we are thinking about. I think if David Ben Gurion had lived to hear your lecture, Dr. Eli, he would rephrase La Friha Tashmama. I think he would have rephrased La Friha Tanishama. I'm just relating to David Ben Gurion, who related to the Negev as desolate. And he said, we need to bloom the desolation. And I think if he had listened to the Dr. Eli's lecture, he have, would have changed his mind. Dr. Maya, you had shown us that <laughs> nature is full of suspense stories. Like every example that you have given us, I was like, like I'm reading like a science fiction novel with a lot of suspense and I think how they could do it and they could survive. And it's like, I think Agatha Christie will have a run after like, hearing your lecture. And I'm thinking also, like relating to the end of your lecture, how many untold story we still don't know? How many organisms are there for us to learn from, to invent the next drug medicine, to invent the next maybe plastic recycling me mechanism? There are so many things that we could learn from nature and such a waste, literally, to throw all of this away with our conduct. And I think if we want to take an action, it's, it's the right time now. And you have shown us, even like by small action, if we can even sign a pledge, no plastic waste, like no uh, one-time reusable plastic, it could have an effect on that bird and make his life easier. Even if we saved one bird, we saved one story that we can learn a lot from. And I think this is what we could take from your lesson. Like humans, everybody has a story. In nature, every organism has its own story, something to learn from, its own universe, and something to mimic. Thank you so much. And now we're going to go to Francis for the Q&A session. Thank you, Farid. Thank you, Maya and Dr. Groner. Um, so there are a few questions from the audience. And if anybody has a question that they'd like to ask out loud, um, please, uh, you can do the raise hand function on Zoom and I'll, I'll try to scroll through that and see if I don't see it, then, then um, message me in the chat. But I will read out some of the questions that were sent in. So one is for Ellie from Hana. If the desert is so inhospitable to life, why do these creatures evolve to be in this habitat? Thank you. Um, usually what happens is that species and populations um, expand their distribution. So what drives them is usually competition. It's overcrowded in one place and then they move to another. Um, I, don't, I don't have time to go into the depth, but I'll just give you a rule of thumb. Uh, creatures who live in the desert, usually, not always, can penetrate the less harsh condition and move in our world north or, or to wetter areas. But creatures that live in wet conditions cannot move into the desert. So basically, if you give desert creatures an opportunity, they would be very happy to live somewhere else, but there's too much competition there. And therefore, they evolve to live somewhere with less competition. Thank you. Another question um, from Gregory for Ellie is, are the, is there a risk of eating desert plants to get water from them? Yes, yeah, some, some plants uh, do have some poisonous. Actually, there is a rule, there's a law that I don't fully understand, but the harsher the conditions, the more plants are have evolved 
to uh, um, have anti-herbivory mechanisms. So um, you, you would imagine that they would put all their energy and, and adaptations to live with the abiotic conditions, but actually they, because they're vulnerable, they put a lot of efforts in, um, in evolving uh, um, thorns and thistles and, uh, and some chemicals that uh, are problematic, but then of course other plants uh, are um, are okay to drink. So there's no uh, rule of thumb which plants you can drink or not. Thank you. Um, I think Becky actually, Dr. Rosengauss had a question if she wants to ask it out loud. Wait two seconds. Okay. Hello, hopefully you guys can hear me. So I had a question for Maya. Uh, first of all, Ellie and, and Maya, thank you so much for inspiring us with all these adaptations that you've uh, given us, uh, really interesting. Uh, for Maya, I really don't know much about this uh, tumbling weeds. Uh, it seems to me an amazing um, way to manage to move from one place to another. Um, I don't know what happens after they tumble and they end, it, end up in a different place. Is, is As they're tumbling, are they delivering the seeds on the ground? or they're tumbling and getting somewhere else where then they will put some roots and grow as a plant. I'm not sure about what's the strategy that they're using. Yeah, okay, so the strategy is really just to scatter the seeds. The plant itself is already dead when it's disattached ah. itself from the roots. So it's completely dry, therefore it's really light weight and it can be rolling with very easy winds. Um, and the whole idea is just to get the seeds out to mm. new and remote lands where they can uh, maybe spring and become new habitats. Great, thank you. And are, you said that they're not native. Where are they from originally? If they're not from the United States, where do they, how do they got here? Yeah, uh, so the, I, I, I think uh, the origin is coming from um, Northeast Asia, so, um, Russia, Mongolia, these areas, um, and but they have been in, in the U.S. area for quite some time, so already from the 17th century. Great, so thank you. They so feel much. at home. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Of course. Um, I'm still waiting for other questions from the audience. Please uh, direct message me if you'd like to speak it out loud or, or send it you know, in a written way and I'll ask it. Um, I have a question for, for both Dr. Groner and for Maya. Um, I guess my question is about any possibilities. You, uh, genetic engineering is obviously a very controversial subject and a lot of people have very strong opinions about it, but do either of you or, or both of you see any sort of potential future value in um, merging biomimicry and genetic engineering to make humans um, more uh, um, resilient to the effects of climate change. So, for example, using um, some of the adaptations from the animals that Ellie pointed out in his lecture, like having longer legs or um, using or having I mean, I don't know how it would be in animals, but to uh, retain, or in humans, but to retain water loss um, in, in drier conditions in different regions. Um, do you, and, and I don't even know if it's possible, but I, as of right now, um, genetic engineering, I think th those advances are a little bit more focused on like eye color or um, strength or things that are perhaps a little bit superficial in the grand scheme of things. But um, do you see any value in using that type of technology, CRISPR, and those advances for um, making us more resilient to increasingly um, drastic conditions? Maya, you want to go first? Oh, wow, talking about sci-fi. Um, I'm trying to put the ethic uh, aspect of it at the side. Uh, do I see value? I think so. I think it will be possible. If it's not already possible, it will be possible. Um, something life uh, taught me is that nothing is impossible. It's only a question of time, resources, and priorities uh, before we learn how to do something. The question is how we do it, under which ethical conditions, and um, do we actually learn? I mean, this would be 
for me type of an end of pipe solution. So we need to evolve um, and look to upstream solutions. So really solving the problem in its source. So trying to prevent or at least slow down climate change must be an effort um, and definitely adaptations for what we can do and what we can tolerate would be next or in parallel. Um, I am not an expert in genetic engineering. I am a little bit concerned about the implications. Uh, there are other technologies that are worrying me, such as nano technologies, because those nano particles can easily um, go into cells. Uh, they, they go into membranes, they go into cell organs, uh, and they can really cause some harm. Um, but again, like every technology, um, technology is not good or bad. Uh, we are the ones who determine how it would be used and to what end and under which conditions. So it's really up to us on what we do with it. Um, I don't know if this answers your questions, but just a few thoughts. Okay, I'll go second. I um, don't like genetic engineering. Um, actually, I was campaigning quite a lot in, the, in England against it. Um, also, genetic engineering is not so simple that you can take a feature and directly uh, copy it to a different species because um, uh, usually uh, a, a, some kind of adaptation is a complex of many, many genes that we don't always know how it works. Um, uh, theoretically, we can study it many years and try to cop copy many genes, but it's not so straightforward. So I wouldn't like to see genetic engineering in general in nature. Uh, in human at the moment, genetic engineering, of course, is not allowed at all. I don't mind if they engineer humans, but please leave the rest of nature alone. Thank you. Um, that's, yeah, it's a very interesting conversation. I also have many qualms about genetic engineering. Um, but I just may ask for questions if there are no questions in the crowd. Can I uh, go? There are a few more questions. We have time. So can I can I ask? Or? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I have two questions also. One for Dr. Eli. So we're actually greening, blooming the desert. So what effects does that have on the desert organisms? Like when you build a city or a kibbutz or a village in the middle of the desert and you're greening it. So what strain put that on the indigenous uh, ecosystem there? And my second question to Dr. Maya after that is, do we have a World Bank for biomimicry? Like I know that the Norwegian government has built an uh, like Noah's Ark in the Arctic to preserve all the seeds for human for the next human generation. So do we have like if I'm interested to read more about it, where should I go? Like if somebody's collecting on a like this like a World Heritage site, like for all the biomimicry, where can I go? Thank you so much, Bob. Okay, so um, I actually don't like uh, Ben Gurion's uh, phrase of blooming the desert. We don't need to bloom the desert. Uh, and, and we see a lot of impact of the fact that um, in Israel, uh, people are moving into the desert. So when people move into the desert, they bring with them agriculture, uh, water from the Sea of Galil, uh, gardens, and that creates an unfair advantage to the Mediterranean uh, species, the ones that are more used to uh, wetter conditions, and they invade the desert and take over from the desert species. So, um, you know, we have to live here. I live in the desert. We have to uh, maybe have some food and have agriculture. But uh, beyond that, there's no need to do, uh, to plant trees. The JNF has been planting trees in the desert. There's no need. 400 millimeters of rain is the natural border for uh, trees, or not for trees, for forests. There are acacia trees, uh, as you know, in other places, but 400 millimeters uh, should be the natural border for forest, and there is no need to, pl uh, to plant trees in the desert. Uh, food is fine, agriculture is fine, but um, we should be careful and uh, protect the, 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 the conditions that allow the desert species to win the competition. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, for um, where can we go to for this biomimetic bank? Um, so, thank you very much for bringing this up. Uh, one of the links that I've shared, I'll bring back 
uh, the slide, if that's okay with you, so you can see it. Um, this one right here. So www.asknature.org. Uh, this is the strongest recommendation I have. This is a, a pool of both uh, biological technologies and um, technological innovations connected to biomimicry. It was uh, put together by the Biomimicry 3.8 organization. That is, uh, here is the link to that as well. Um, currently, this is the best um, pool of knowledge that is connected to biomimicry. You can search for, um, uh, the search question is, how does nature, and then you put in the function. So how does nature cools, or how does nature thermoregulates, or how does nature um, create structures, and so on. Uh, and it would pull up everything that was uh, sometimes mentioned that could be connected to. Also, you can search by organisms. So you can go and search camel and see if there's anything that was created based on it. Um, or if there are some cool mechanisms that were uh, recognized and still have not been used uh, for applications. Uh, so definitely look that up. It's very interesting just to play around with. Um, also, the other links here could be could give you a really good starting point for, for the field. Thanks for asking again. Thanks. Um, there is another question for Maya, and I apologize in advance if I mispronounced your name. This is from Kiran Tarshini. Um, how can we improve food security and storage through biomimicry? Has there been any research on this? That's a great question because I've spent the last six years on projects to reduce food waste uh, in Israel. Uh, we recently published uh, an article about this uh, and we focused mostly on policies. So there's much we can do before we go to technology uh, because just the way we design our food systems, uh, the way we plan, the way we use it, the way we store it, the very basic and simple things can cut away very significant percentage of, uh, of the losses and wastes. Uh, but also for technology, there are a few great ways uh, to improve itself. I have not uh, come across any biomimetic solutions for this specifically, but definitely if we look at uh, ways in which um, organisms can uh, store and find food, I'm pretty sure we can find some sources of inspiration. Um, this could also be uh, on the chemistry level. So um, some, some materials that are biodegradable and can maybe lengthen the shelf life of some food, perhaps can be developed based on some uh, natural materials. Um, and also, so maybe behavioral mechanisms uh, for storage, for example. I'm, I'm not suggesting we're gonna bury our food in the ground um, as squirrels do, for example. Um, they also plant trees in the, in the midst of this mechanism, but um, just the way nature is being super efficient about food could be some sort of uh, inspiration for us. But so far, I've not, as I said, I could not find specific technologies that use biomimicry. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see some coming on in the, in the coming years. I think it's a really hot area and many people are looking into that now. Thank you. There's um, one more question for, I imagine, both of you, and then we'll, I'll give it over to Farid to wrap it up. This is a question from Amir. Do you think the project of the Red Sea Dead Sea Canal can help biological species resist the clim climate change and the, climate, the effects of climate change, or would it be against biological adaptation? This is for Ellie. <laughs> Uh, yes, I actually was part of the uh, group that were trying to predict the impact of uh, the, the conduit. It's not called canal now, it used to be called canal. Now it's called the conduit because a lot, some of it is uh, above ground and some of it are in tunnels. Um, I don't, I couldn't find, I tried very hard to find um, um, scenarios where it will really damage the environment. Obviously, if there's an earthquake and a lot of water is spilled, then there could be a, an area with a lot of water and that that area will be disturbed. But overall, I don't see environmental impact. 
There are other concerns about the water itself, either from the Red Sea or from the Dead Sea. And some people are worried that um, taking the brine, the idea is to take, to desalinate the water, to take the clean water to Amman and to take the brine into the Dead Sea. And some people are worried that the brine uh, mixing with the Dead Sea will form some kind of a gypsum that will uh, sink. But uh, overall, I think it's a good solution. Mm. I have nothing to add on this matter. I'm not an expert in this. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Groner and Maya and Reed. I'll leave it to you. Wow, we were on time. Thank you so much <laughs> for fascinating, interesting lectures. And I think, again, we should act now. And I think what we are learned from both your lectures, go like be, try to be activist, like be the change, the, the change that you want to see in this world even small initiatives. We don't know which species we're gonna lose next and which innovation we're gonna lose with it. So thank you so much, dear. And I would love to remind our audience that Francis is going to share the feedback link. So uh, please fill it. It's very important for us to hear from you, to learn from you and to know your feedback. That's how we improve and innovate also. Also, I would love to remind you about our interactive community. Last uh, Sunday, we have really successful uh, two, uh, um, two interactive community uh, projects, and we would love to continue this tradition so that we could keep this community alive. So please join us. And uh, if you want to present in our next uh, session, you could email any of us, and we would love to have you at the end of the session to present your project and network you and connect you with the rest of our interactive community. Thank you so much, everybody. A Ramadan Karim, and I hope for the people who are fasting that they have easy fasting and delicious iftar. And looking forward to see you at our next session, 25th, about the spirituality and religion's relationship with uh, environment and nature. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night, Laila Tov. It's Bye bye. I'm adding yeah, to that. Thank you. Bye, Maya. Bye, Ellie. Thank you so much. We appreciate you teaching us all of this awesome stuff. Amazing. By the way, Ellie was my lecturer at AIS. I don't know if you did mention that, Francis. Me, so. uh, he was mine as well. Yeah, so he was at the AIS. Like he was, course was obligatory. Now I don't know if you're still there, Ellie, or not. Yeah, I'm still there, but you didn't call me uh, Dr. Ellie when you were there, neither did Francis. <laughs> no, it's more casual. But... Okay, thank you. Bye. Well, thank, you. thank you again. Thank oh. you both. Appreciate thank you. it. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. Have a good week. Ramadan Karim to everybody. Ramadan Karim to everyone. Bye-bye.